you'll hear two friends planning an event. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Joan. I'm glad you could come. Hello, Peter. What's up? Is something the matter? No, no. Everything's fine. It sounded urgent on the phone. Did it? It's just that I've had this idea and I wanted to see how soon we could get it off the ground. Well, don't keep me in suspense. You know they're planning to close down the local clinic. It was in the newspaper yesterday, but most people have actually known for some time. Well, I thought we should do something about it. What did you have in mind? I thought we could organise a charity event and donate the money to the clinic. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it will show the local council how we feel and that we mean business. That'll take quite a lot of organising. Why don't we just hold a protest outside the town hall? A protest would take just as much organisation as an event like this. Besides, I think fewer people would turn up. A village fair or something like that would attract more people and get money for the clinic. People are more generous when they're enjoying themselves. OK, then. It sounds good to me. How do we start? First, we put our heads together and come up with a list of people who'll be willing to help and people who can provide us with some of the things we need. For example, we might need a caterer to provide refreshments, a rock band for entertainment, tents and so on. Then. We do a lot of telephoning around and try to get everybody together at the same time in the same place. Sounds like a lot of work to me. But that's only the beginning. First things first, though. Let's decide now on who to get to the initial meeting and where and when to hold it. Fine. Well, the village hall would be the best place to have the meeting. It's not as big as the youth club, but it's warmer. There'll be no problem getting permission to use it, but I suppose it depends on how many people we invite. We don't want too many, otherwise the meeting will go on too long and nothing will get decided. But the village hall is a good idea. It's more official than having it in someone's living room. How many? Six or eight people to start with? Ten at the most? OK. Now we have to decide on a suitable day and time. Suitable to everybody, I mean. A Saturday or Sunday would seem to be the best choice because people aren't at work on those days. But they may not like the idea of giving up a part of their weekend for a meeting. Unless we persuade them it's for a good cause, or that it's to their advantage, and that it'll all be a lot of fun. We'll provide refreshments, of course. What if some don't want to give up their weekend? Then we'll give them an alternative, say, one evening in the week after everybody's finished work. We'll see which is the most acceptable to them, then book the hall. I can do the refreshments for the meeting. I'll get Darren and Maggie to help me. I'm sure they'll be more than willing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, what's next on the agenda? A list of who we want at the meeting. Yes, of course. Obviously, we want someone from the clinic. I think Dr Perkins would be best. He can tell us exactly what the financial situation is there. You know, 
how much money it takes to keep the place running, and how important it is for the community to have the clinic. The vicar too, he can rally lots of support, and Mr. Sims, our member of parliament, he is very busy. But I think I can persuade him to come, or get his wife to persuade him to come. I see her quite a lot socially. That's great. Two other people I have in mind are Freddie Smith, the journalist. Yes. Well, he's the editor of the local paper now and might be useful. He might let us advertise for free, and he'll know how to go about getting leaflets and posters printed. That's another thing. We'll need volunteers to put leaflets through people's doors and stick up posters all over the place. We can decide that at the meeting. What about the other person? What other person? You said you had two people in mind: Freddie Smith and. Oh yes, Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates, do I know him? You must do. He owns Greatfields Farm. We need a large area to hold the fete. Right. So how many have we got then? Seven or eight? There's Dr. Perkins, Mr. Sims, that journalist. Freddie Smith, you mean? Yes, him, and the vicar and Mr. Gates, the farmer. That's only five. There's you and me. That's seven. That will do for now. Let's start making phone calls. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job, and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently, and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list. So for you, it's best to plan ahead. And be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are: Are there enough toilet facilities, and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier-free, so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. 
These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you, within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organizer in their busy conference center, organizing and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment, and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at nine a.m., so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at ten a.m. And then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company, which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3:30 p.m., and after that, you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning, we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this, and it'll leave from outside the refectory. At 8 a.m., you'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library. And it'll run from 10:30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. You have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now, if for no other reason than it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. But we must press on, and I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird, the role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. 
it was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices, to try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union, to take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba, or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Now turns to part four. Part four. Well, it's the beginning of the digital age, and technology is all set to completely revolutionize the way we watch TV, videos, and DVDs, and play computer games at home. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, it's the beginning of the digital age, and technology is all set to completely revolutionise the way we watch TV, videos and DVDs, and play computer games at home. Here to tell us more about how we will be spending our leisure time at home in future is Anna Zabel. Hello. Yes. There will be huge changes in the way we use television, radio and new media in future. By this I mean we will be able to do what we want, where we want and when we want. The result is that our homes will increasingly become home theatres. And all our entertainment at home will be available at the touch of a button. Now, most home entertainment these days is delivered over wires, but this is changing thanks to high-speed broadband. Downloading will become easier and studios will eventually release movies, songs and video games directly to the consumer. So, for example, instead of a film opening on the big screen and eventually appearing on television, video and the internet, it can appear in all formats at once. This means that we will have more choice and control over the media we use. So, how will we use this media in our homes in future? There will be big changes in how we watch video and television. Several research groups and companies are trying to add depth to TV and other video displays in the form of a third dimension. So television and video screens will have depth. What do you mean by depth exactly? Do you mean 3D, like a hologram? That's right. 
When we say that a hologram has three dimensions, it means that we can see not only up and down and left and right, but forwards and backwards too. When we talk about dimensions, we call forwards and backwards depth. So when we say that a hologram has three dimensions, it means we can see up and down and left and right, just like a picture or photo. But we can also look into the hologram because the image it contains has depth. So instead of watching films on a flat screen, we will be watching them in 3D. Absolutely. Well, as we live in a 3D world, we shouldn't really be watching television and films in 2D, and the technology to make this happen is already there. 3D screens are being developed, which can be placed throughout the house. Even in busy areas of our homes, like doorways and halls, now these screens appear to float in air. So in the future, 3D holographic images will be sent into our homes, and we will be able to experience the action as if it is taking place right in front of our eyes. So the action won't just look real; it will be real. Incredible! Now, how does this technology work? Well, to get true 3D, each of your eyes has to see a slightly different image. 3D screens interweave multiple images in vertical stripes using special coatings and filters built into the screen. This means that each eye sees a different set of stripes. These screens are called lenticular screens. Now, these screens are easy to produce. And some laptop PCs and cell phones already have them. However, lenticular screens do have one disadvantage: the strain on the eyes and brain of putting together a 3D image from two flat ones can result in headaches and dizziness. But a few companies have developed a hologram 3D display which does not cause these problems. Instead of building images, then leaving them to the brain to put together. Holograms create a whole image that reaches the eye exactly the way light from a real object does. You can even walk part of the way round a holographic image to see side and back views, just as you would do if the object was right in front of you. Twin holograms will let a couple watch two different programs on the same screen, even if they sit next to each other on the living room sofa. So no more arguing about which program to watch. That's right. Patio screens are being developed too. Patio screens? What are they exactly? Well, a patio screen is a big inflatable screen, which means you can take it outside your home and watch a film in your garden. Some patio screens are even equipped with DVD players, and some new ones may even have a wireless connection. Amazing developments there. Well, join us after the break when we will be talking. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I thought I had it figured out, believed in us. We were meant to be, no doubt, a teenage love. Everybody else could see the way we were living in a fantasy. When I kiss her. I 